Welcome to an episode of InRange, coming to you from the heart of Billy the Kid Country in Lincoln, New Mexico, where Annette Evans from On Her Own has joined me, not only to talk to you about a number of topics and doing some more collaboration, but also we did a cool Billy the Kid tour today around town. Which was super fun. Uh, I've, everybody's heard of Billy the Kid, mm -hmm. right? That's If you've been in America for more than about 4.8 minutes, you've heard about Billy the Kid. Yep. But seeing where it actually happened is just a whole different thing. It changes it. Like, you can read these stories, but every time with history, when you're actually in the space, and you're like, this is literally the wall. They shot their rifle from behind. It changes the paradigm, and it gives a perception that's more And, and that's palpable. how far they ran. When you're talking about that 900-yard elevated shot, we could talk about a 900-yard shot, and we know it's far mm -hmm. like, intellectually, but then you stand at the window and look up into the mountain and you're like, oh, that's really, really far away. I can't even pick out individual trees out there. Absolutely. So for those of you that are not aware of it, this is actually a video on InRange, but during the multiple day siege of the uh, McSween house, when the regulators were attacked, not only by the opposing forces, but also the military, uh, a couple of the regulators were hanging out in what's called the Montano store. And they saw some of the opposition on the mountain, 900 yards away. One of them tuned his zero on his Buffalo rifle, took a single shot and got the guy. At 900 yards, irons, irons. during conflict, pretty uh, wild. Elevated nine, 900 yards. Yeah, it was an too. elevated shot too because they were firing from a lower position above. Yeah, pretty amazing. I know the vast majority of people can't do that with a rifle today. Oh, period. I heard someone. It's so funny, but you know we live in a world of competition and training circles. Me with the brutality matches and all that, and you do everything you do, and like so we have a somewhat interesting alternative take on things because our perception is a little skewed because. I know, I have heard stories where someone was bragging about, I made a 50 yard shot with a red dot on a rifle. And you're like, wow. <laughs> yes. was, what, did you do it one handed drunk? I mean, like, not that you should use guns drunk, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So, on one hand, any accomplishment is an accomplishment. Oh, I know, I know. But on the other hand, there are accomplishments and there are accomplishments. Yeah, I'm just talking about perception is, perception yeah, is like all of that, hard. right? Yeah. Yeah, like so, what's actually hard? A 900 yard shot with. From ele to elevation, an elevated shot with irons. With a buffalo rifle, a buffalo which has the trajectory rifle. of a rainbow. It goes... And yeah. they managed to drop it in and drop it in accurately enough to drop... Oh, yeah. Went right through the guy. Yeah, like, mm. that's just... If it didn't... If there weren't witnesses and accounts of that, I wouldn't believe it. No, yeah, but it's a definitely confirmed story. And even the opposition was trying to go get the... the uh, the body, and they couldn't because the fire from the Montano store continued to be so harassing they couldn't do it. So it's pretty fascinating. It's really cool. But what we're here to do at the moment is do a Q&A. We've got a bunch of questions. So we can't talk about Smokey the Bear? We can talk about Smokey Bear too. Smokey Bear was really cool. Yeah. I did not realize Smokey Bear was fr literally from this area, and yeah, that was really neat. Yeah, he was a cute little guy that survived a f the, the fire in the mountains, and one of the firefighters rescued him, and he became a mascot as a result. He's a real bear. He's not just a cartoon character that says only you. <laughs> nope. And he's buried in Capitan, New Mexico, which is really close to Lincoln, just outside, inside Billy the Kid Country, actually, because that's also Billy Kid Country. It is. It's cool. You can see his grave there today. So, yeah, we can talk about random stuff, too, but while we're at it, we'll but start. Let's q &A. We'll start with a question first. Huh? So we got this one from Lord Bacon. Yum. Uh, I've often heard about the significant increase in minorities and women owning and carrying guns over the last 20 years. What hurdles did you encounter when making the decision to become a gun owner from purchasing your first gun to obtaining training to deciding how to broach the topic with family and friends? Wow, that's a multi-part question. Yeah, it is. So when I started shooting in 2006, so a hot minute from now, my, my shooting career is old enough to vote. And on one hand, it was really simple because I was lucky to live in a part of the country. I'm from mm -hmm. southeastern PA where... It wasn't super unusual. It was a little unusual to see a woman coming in and buying her own gun and all that. But mm -hmm. I didn't have people who were patronizing in a belittling way. They were very kind to me. They were very helpful. Or they were trying to be helpful. They thought far. they were being helpful, right? Yeah, and I, yeah. I did not get recommendations for the little pink revolver or anything like that. People were just nice. It I'm really honestly kind of bad. impressed to hear that. Like, yeah. that surprises me in 2006. Because... Yeah. Um, well, you didn't live in New York City. That would have been a problem, right? But like not patronizing is, uh, it's interesting when we talk about this, and I don't want to take away from your answer because I'd like to hear more about that. But when you, what you made me think about when you said 2006 is I'm like, in some ways, we think about the gun culture getting better. 
but I think it's also gotten worse before it's gotten better. Like at one point, I remember way back when, it feels like it was more accepting than it became. Which, but anyways, that's a different topic. But so I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was kind of expecting to not fit in, to be put in a sort of place where, you know, you don't belong here. You're not. But people were super kind, super welcoming. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't grow up in gun culture or anything like that. It was literally, I wanted to learn how to shoot because I thought every girl should learn how to shoot a gun. Like it, it sounded cool. It sounded like a useful life skill. Mm. Like, um, my uh, now ex was had shot uh, competitively in high school. He shot for his high school rifle team, mm. small bore Positional rifle. Positional rifle, yeah. And he had uh, gone on a work bonding trip with his coworkers and they'd gone to the local indoor range and rented guns and shot them. Mm. Like, that's cool. I want to do that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, blind leading the blind. That's how we got into it. And people were kind. They were nice. You know, I don't, either I was blind to it or they were very good about it. And to me, that's the same thing. You know, they weren't bad up to me or they weren't patronizing or insulting to me in any way that I could notice and that's good enough for me mm. brought me in you know I got great training I was very very fortunate that some of my early classes were with excellent instructors set me down a really good path you kind of it sounds like you kind of lucked out you really hit like a I good did. place yeah my first like non NRA defensive pistol class we used the shot timer in like 2008 yeah, sounds like you really did. It. You, <laughs> Super you sounds lucked like out. you really lucked out. Yeah. And and I've lucked out kind of all the way through my training career in some really male dominated classes and areas where it was just, oh, you're willing to come here and do the work? Cool. Come here and do the work. Which is the way it should be. Like that should be anyone that comes to the table should be willing and should be provided the equal opportunity to learn and train. And I won't say I haven't had my share of off color jokes and yeah. things like that. But I got to say, the love language in some of these communities is insulting you. Yeah, you've talked about this before we brought, we talked about this in our yeah. uh, discussion in, at Woodland Brutality. Yeah. Like razzing one. each other is part of the deal a little bit. Yeah. And, and the, the trick is the people who are razzing you, if they're doing it clearly friendly, if you know they will stop, if it really bothers you, it, if they don't start out with it, if they start out nice and then they start razzing you, that's how you know you're part mm. of it. And I know that's hard sometimes because you're like, well, they're being mean. They're teasing me. Like, dig through that a little bit and see what they're really doing. There's also respectful teasing and not respectful too, right? These right. These are different things. They're very different. Yeah. So I didn't, I found it, certainly I was a minority in the places I went. When I started okay. shooting competitively in 2009, 2010, I would very often win high lady because I was the only lady. I'd come in last place and be high lady. Mm. And that's very, very different from the way it is today, where it's still not a huge population of women at matches, but much, much more. But nobody said I didn't belong there. They were excited I showed up. That's cool. The other part of the question, though, is... How did you broach it with family and or friends? Like, was that a was that a contentious thing to even bring up with the people around you, or was it not really? It wasn't hugely contentious. I grew up in a fairly rural area. Okay. So that kind of helped. My, my parents didn't particularly have an opinion mm. about it. Uh, from a friend's perspective, you know, most people didn't particularly have an opinion. Didn't make, a, didn't make a big deal out of it, but it was like... Dual income, no kids. This was our Saturday date. We'd go to the range. Mm. You know, we'd go Fun. have brunch, go to the range. It sounded very harmless, and I think that helped. It's, well, it was. Yeah, because it was very harmless. <laughs> yeah, it it was wasn't harmless. like, I'm yeah. going for paramilitary training with no, no. my new gun. It was, yeah. my husband and I have found a new activity that we can do together and that we really it. enjoy. That's totally wholesome and harmless. There's nothing wrong with that at all, of course. Yeah. And I actually found that more people were gun-friendly than I thought when I presented it that way. RGB, how much time should a person who wants to be secure but has no real specific threat spend on self-defense preparedness, assuming they do not necessarily wish to engage in martial arts or shooting as a hobby? So I guess it's, I guess it's how, yeah, that's a hard one. Yeah. There's a little bit of as much or as little as you want. I guess I, I read this and I don't know if this is what this means, but like what's the minimum that you think is reasonable for just an average person? Because everybody should have some level of this, right? 
there's a certain level that is a common, what I would call a common sense level. Yeah. Spending the time to make sure your locks are secure. You have good locks on your doors. Mm. That you know who has keys to your doors. Mm -hmm. To think about, hey, where do I park when I go to work? Am I out in the far reaches of the parking lot? Do mm -hmm. I need a flashlight? This sort of everyday thing. And the everyday thing that isn't physical self-defense against another person. Do I have a fire extinguisher in my kitchen? Is mm -hmm. it in date? You know, do I have an emergency fund for my finances? This sort of thing you could build into your daily, weekly, mm -hmm. monthly life. I don't think it requires a ton of time. Uh, from us, again, going back to the personal self-defense perspective, pepper spray. I, there's videos on my channel where we can teach you pepper spray in 10 minutes. It doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot. Is it better to have more time in on practicing how to manage people approaching you, how to you know navigate this or that, Contact or learn management. how to shoot a gun, or how to fight someone? As much or as little as you find comfortable, there's, there's a lot to be said for living your life without regret. Do that. I think that's going to be more important than anything else. Yeah, everything has risk with it, right? And, I mean, lightning strikes in many ways, in horrible ways sometimes. But if you're, if you're at the point where you're using a gun, probably a lot of things have gone wrong. A lot. Generally speaking. I mean, there are... There's, there's always, as you say, lightning strikes. And yeah, sometimes yeah. you get unlucky and things happen. But at the end of the day, do the things that make sense to you. And remember that self-defense isn't just about learning how to fight people and all of that and learning how to shoot and whatever else that we kind of imagine that fight looks like. It's the little things. It's also surrounding yourself with the right people, right? I mean, a bad partner is a bad partner. And that's where a lot of violence comes from in this world. And people don't necessarily, um, on every in every gender, in every relationship, don't necessarily do what they know they, in their heart, need to do. Because that's hard. But how many times has that culminated in something bad? That's far more important than learning martial arts, than just keeping dangers away. And just think about your friend group. And we all know about, you know, who you get in trouble with. Who you go and <laughs> Every like... time I hang out with that person, I'm drunk in an alley. How many drunk in the alleys do you go through before something goes wrong? <laughs> Maybe you need to rethink your friendship with that person, or at least what you do with them. Yep. Or maybe you need to put a hard limit on how much you're drinking with that particular group of friends. Fair enough. These are some of these are gonna. This is the next question is this is I think maybe this is objective. Maybe this is subjective. You know more than I because this is more your world for sure. Kurosawa for the win seven. What is the best martial art for general self defense? I know what your answer is gonna be, but I want to hear it. This is assuming your hands and body are your only weapons. So you I'm actually going to give you an answer you're not going to. Oh, okay. Expect I'm surprised first. to hear this. I'm good. So the first answer I'm going to give you is the idealized answer of wrestling. Okay, yeah. However, adult wrestling programs are pretty much non-existent in the United States. Or they're completely sport-oriented, fair? It doesn't even matter if they're sport-oriented. They just don't even have You just have don't it. have adult okay. wrestling programs. It's usually something that you do in like junior high, high school. More and more girls are doing it. Sure. But it's not really a thing to be like, I'm 33 years old and I'd like to learn how to wrestle. Sure. doesn't really exist. Okay. So now's the answer you expect. Um. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Right. That's where I was waiting for. <laughs> because that's a grappling, a, a, a mostly grappling. It is a mostly yeah. grappling sport at a good school. Whether it's sport oriented or self-defense oriented, you're going to learn a little bit of wrestling. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn some stand-up. You're going to learn how to be comfortable while you are uncomfortable, not panicked by it. One of the things that I think is incredible about BJJ is this idea that you can end up on the ground with somebody smashing you, smothering you, and you don't panic about it anymore. You don't like You do it, it first, I must assume. Most people do. Yeah. They're are, are quite unhappy with the experience. Yeah, experience. It, 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 it sucks. Not fun. No. Yeah. But in relatively short order, you get to the point where you're like, I don't like this. It's not pleasant, but I don't feel like I'm going to immediately die. You're the you're the dog with the room on fire. This is fine. <laughs> this is fine. This is fine. I still do that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. and, but think about the scariest thing that you've ever done. And 
you weren't panicked about it. Mm. You know, like somebody who drives a lot and the first time they're in that, or the second time they're in that ice storm and they're like, this sucks. I hate driving in sleet. The roads are bad. Yeah, right. But you're just resigned. You're but just the going, first time you're terrified. The first time you're like, I yeah, don't know what to do. Yeah. Wheel fear weird. Like, yeah, yeah. The second time you're like, well, this sucks. I went down a, a snowy, icy road the, uh, last week, mm. actually. And, you know, my car starts drifting and I'm just like, well, this is not cool. Let me, like, jiggle the wheel so that I end up back where I want to be and not slam on the brakes. But the stress inoculation and previous experience allowed you to do the more intelligent thing. Right, which was which, not panic. Which is also the same thing in BJJ when you're on the ground and maybe not getting out of that grab, that, that grip, right? It's not... Panicking isn't going to help. Right. Yeah. And it's not necessarily it teaches you the technique to get out and prevail. It teaches you how to go, well, this sucks, but let me see if I can solve this problem. You know, it's funny you say that because I know that this is not, the, not exactly the same thing, but one of the things that I think is a benefit that's never discussed in really good level, what I think are the right types, or even any firearms competition, is it's also a stress inoculator. Oh, absolutely. You get to the point where like, when you start with a buzzer, you're like, ooh, ooh. and then like, now when the buzzer goes off, I don't even, I'm like, whatever. Like, it's like, cool, it's irrelevant. But that does transcend to other things. And stress inoculation, whatever form you're finding it in, is good for you. And if you can handle a knife, or a grapple, or a situation, or a firearm, without that, ooh, you're going to be better mm -hmm. in any situation. Yeah. Because it the, these martial arts aren't necessarily about, and now I have a technique, you know, I yeah. can like tiger claw, whatever. <laughs> that's, Magic dragon puff attack or something. Yeah. That, that's not the point to me. The point is I'm not feeling useless and hopeless and panicked. Ooh. I've got something. Love that. Makes sense. And BJJ is a lot of fun and it's really good for you. Louis S. As a smaller man, what are the best non-firearm self-defense options I have at my disposal? Carrying a firearm isn't always an option for me. And while I wouldn't say I'm out of shape, I just don't have mass to comfortably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone larger than me. Interesting. That's a BJJ talk too, isn't it? Obviously, de-escalation and leaving the situation will always be my first choice. But I am also a member of a targeted group and that won't always be an option. So... I love this question because it reminds people that when we talk about women's self-defense versus self-defense, we're really saying self-defense for people who might not have the physical attributes of other people in the self-defense world. Right. It really shouldn't be gendered. We're just talking about differences in size and mass, strength, all these things, right? Right. And but we can make some broad generalizations. Yeah, but we'll that's not always consistent either, right? So yeah. this is a great question because... A lot of the advice that is good for you is actually going to be women's self-defense right. advice. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you're feminine or you're girly or whatever. It's because you're smaller. And that's a great thing to recognize. In terms of what's effective, my favorite tool is pepper spray. Yeah. We were talking about that before the Q&A even. Pepper spray is relatively well-priced, tends to be under $15, $20 a canister. Mm -hmm. It is legal in 50 states with different levels of hoop jumping in order to buy it. Mm -hmm. It tends to be legal to carry in most states, mm -hmm. again, with some limitations that are actually pretty broad. The New Jersey limitation on pepper spray lets you like carry around a bug bogger size of canister. And uh, even in the areas where it's restricted, it tends to be the kind of tool where it's more of a please don't have that here, please throw it away, then, and now you're going to jail because you brought a gun where you shouldn't have one. Yeah, the public perception of pepper spray is one that is entirely, almost entirely always, even from oppositional forces, seen as a self-defense tool. Right. Like, and firearms are as contentious because we see them used as offensive weapons you know it's pretty hard to offensively use pepper spray i guess you it's becoming, could it's becoming a thing it could happen sure it's like if you want to attack and mug someone pepper spraying them first is probably a good tactic but it's not perceived that way and right. and I'll, I'll, i was gonna i was gonna say the thing that i was gonna say one of the things that gets me in trouble unless you're a cop you're probably not killing someone with pepper spray either sorry well, pepper spray is, <laughs> they, you, they, pepper spray is by definition you know a 
It is technically a less lethal. It's really, really hard. You to apply beat enough of anything. The only reason I said that is that actually did happen. Like there was like they just sprayed someone so badly for so long. That and it, there's some very, very rare yeah. allergies. Et oh sure, et you, you happen to get the wrong person. And, but it's yeah. really, really. It's it's got the best safety record of mm-hmm. pretty much any kind of force that you can use, sure. including going hands on, like. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, a single punch the right way will kill a person real quick. So it's got a great safety record. It's easy to use. If you end up having to dump it because you can't have it somewhere, you're, like, less than 20 bucks out. Yep. Uh, And it's really, really effective. And you can buy a couple of them and, like... Just litter them in places. Well, you could no, you could also try it not yeah. on yourself, but like practice what it looks like. There's, well, there's trainers. I know there are, but even if you let's say you can't, you're at the local sportsman's warehouse. They don't have a trainer. Eh, don't do this indoors, but buy two of them. Go outside someplace where there's air and like I don't know, spray a trash can or something. At least you get an idea of what it does. You can get an idea of what yeah. it does pretty easily. It's yeah. easily trainable. It's easy to use. And one of the things that Chuck Haggard has told me that I really like is if you screw up pepper spray, you, it's generally an I'm sorry event. Oh, if you used it inappropriately? Oh, I didn't realize you were just trying to sell me cookies. <laughs> it could be awkward. It could be difficult. Ooh, yeah. But because it doesn't You're right. permanently hurt people as a general rule. You role, misuse a single action army. You've got a much bigger problem. Yeah. So yeah. Being able to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't like that. Maybe yeah. I jumped the gun a little bit. Sure. So that, Versus, I'm sorry, you're bleeding out your pancreas right now. Yeah. Right, yeah. So that's really my favorite recommendation. Like, if I had to pick one tool for everybody to carry and know how to use, pepper spray is going to be it. It's also very accessible. Super, super. Yeah. Uh, but not bug spray. No, don't I, I know that spray. wasn't the question, but I just thought about I hear that, and I saw the comments well, in my brain. Let's skip ahead a little, because there's actually a question okay, about, good, good, um, good. what's your favorite pepper spray? And a really, oh. really simple... From Tactical Bagels. Tactical Bagels. Yeah. You know, what's your favorite pepper spray? Do you have a better non-lethal recommendation for a young woman who frequently closes up shop by herself, basically has no upper body strength, mm. who sounds a lot like Louis Well, this F. is a similar question from it's a different person. From yeah, a different huh? person. Uh, and she, she, or I'm assuming she, but, you know, I greatly appreciate and that's excellent demonstration of the usefulness of stun guns. Thank you. And so does bad guy number one. And fortunately convinced my sister not to rely on one, but I want to make sure she has the best tool available given her limitations. Yep. So the entire conversation we just had for Louie there is just copy, paste it. Yep. Carl, yep, yep. you can like just like take the video and just like paste it in here if you yeah, want. Yeah, no, totally. And but in terms of my favorite pepper spray, and I have an article or two on, on her own dot life about selecting pepper spray in terms of like what technical components you're looking for and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I have a financial relationship with POM, P-O-M, pepper spray. You've mentioned them before. But the reason I had that relationship with them is I reached out to them because it was my favorite pepper spray at the time, and it still is my favorite pepper spray. It said, hey, I'd love to work with you because I already love your product. So let's have a mutually beneficial relationship here. That makes sense. So Palm, I think, is an excellent, excellent product. And the On Her Own Collab Pack gets you a trainer and an extra pepper spray. Yeah. Because, you know. But it's not the only pepper spray I recommend. The other one that I like is the Saber Red Spray. I want to be really clear. I like the spray and not the gel. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I think that's also an excellent product and available in some larger sizes, things like that. And in a pinch... Bear spray. I was just going to ask me. You said larger sizes. I think of the giant can of bear spray. The giant can of bear spray. That stuff is regulated. You know what's in it. From Mm. quality perspective, pretty good. You can certainly get into some (laughs) arguments of. We're better at protecting the animals that are attacking us than we are dealing with self-defense tools. Right. We we could certainly have a debate about whether it's appropriate to use a defense spray labeled for use against bears against humans. Uh, I'll leave that to somebody who. Maybe Runk- Ian Runkle will yeah, talk maybe. about that. I don't know. But it is, from a technical perspective, an ex- it, the same kind of product. And inevitable bear jokes in the comments below. All right. Smoky uh, Bear says hello. <laughs> Green Ruin. I feel like this is actually aligns exactly with what we're talking about right now. We should skip back up to well, no, I, want, I want to do this one first, so if okay. you don't mind, because it fits with the conversation. Uh, Green Ruin says, what viable strategies are there for women who live in jurisdictions that don't allow any kind of weapons? That sounds like pepper spray again. That seems like the least regulated thing. It, yeah, in most places that does tend to be the least regulated and the one that's going to get you in the least trouble. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, there's a lot of school campuses that will say you can't have pepper spray. There's places. There's places that will tell you you can't have pepper spray. It is your personal decision how, how you want to manage that. Sure. For some people, they'll go, I'm not going to get in that much trouble. It's okay. There's other people who go, I got to follow these rules. There's no way I can get kicked out of here. That might, might also depend on the life situation. That's you're in, perfectly right? valid. Yeah. So one alternate tool I like for that is really, really good flashlight. Okay. Okay. So okay. a very high quality flashlight, good candela. Um, lots of lumens helps, but really the candela helps. And it's going to have a similar effect to pepper spray Blinding. in that initial sort of like flinch mm -hmm, mm -hmm. response. And the other nice thing about flashlights is when you're using them, you look like you're paying attention in a way that's very obvious. Makes sense. So when you're You in literally that, have my attention right now because I'm shining this at you. I'm in a dark parking lot or dark parking garage. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like playing my flashlight around, looking around. Yeah, yeah, you're paying attention. You're paying attention. You might be paying attention anyway, but they right, can't but no, see they, it. Right, but they know you're paying they attention. They now see it. They, they know you are on the ball enough yeah, to be Yeah, you're like literally beaming the them like, I see you over there. How are you? Or I'm, I could see you over there because mm. I'm looking in all these other corners. That's actually not the worst start. That well, makes a lot of sense. And they're really useful for when you drop your keys under the seat. You can't. Yeah, yeah, they're useful for actually finding stuff in the dark, too. Mailboxes. I hate sticking my hand <laughs> in the dark mailbox because yeah. there's it's like, are there spiders in there? This mm. is how we find the possum. Mm -mm. All right. Jordan W., uh, general for both, although I'm not sure how I'm going to answer this one. What are some skills you've developed now that you didn't expect to be so fundamental or useful when you started working in your current spheres? Wow. The obvious answer is jujitsu, because I, I started jujitsu with the expectation that I'd go for six months or a year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and learn some basic skills, learn how not to panic and move on with my life. I train four days a week now. It, it is it's basically my entire life. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's, it's become fundamental, not only in terms of the hard skills that I can use and I can teach and I can talk about. It's just good for my mental health. It's good yep. for my physical health. It's been a great way for me to just exist. And whether it's jujitsu or some other sort of activity like that, that like really brings you to life. It's definitely good for the mental health. It's just yeah. good for everything. And yep. being in that space it just puts me in a better place to be able to do this work. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because I know this is a self-defense oriented conversation, but I read this and I like, you know what the first thing that popped in my head is making YouTube thumbnails. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm like the, when I started this project, I made just like screenshot, cool graphic, and then and then text, and then I come to realize like <sighs> thumbnails are like way more important than I thought, and I I'm so focused on the information and the content that I try to make. That that stuff to me is like, ah, it turns out, super important. So, yeah, I'm getting better at that. that, that weird answer, but it's the truth. You know what else has been really useful? Yeah. Knowing how to write. Oh. Really, like, have good, solid writing skills, communication skills. Communication skills in general. In general, like, you use it to draw boundaries. You use it to tell people, hey, you're going to stay over there or else. You use it to say, hi, I need help. This is the help that I need. It's, I use it to tell you what you can do to be safer. Yeah. It, communication, huge, huge, huge. P my friends know how much I complain sometimes about people that I work with in various parts of my life. Mm. I'm like, would you just follow the written directions that I gave you? Uh, this is appropriate in all things in life, right? Anything. A Your it, job, anything, anything. And it will, in fact, keep you safer because you should, in fact, read the Manual. <laughs> yes. Matisse E. What are you seeing slash hearing about the impact of the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, which changed the way many local jurisdictions evaluate issuing concealed carry permits? Example, they can no longer require proof of good cause. I don't, this is outside of my wheelhouse. I don't know about this particular case, to be honest. And I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Bruin is probably the most important Second Amendment case that we've had in recent Supreme well, Court's here, history. Here's the deal. I live, in, I live in Arizona, and I don't think about this stuff very much because it's so liberal on gun laws that I'm not saying I shouldn't pay more attention, but the truth is I kind of can do anything I want. 
And so I don't really think about it, but that doesn't mean this isn't important. I'm just not, it's not, it's hard to, uh, there's only so many lions to pay attention to in the room. And when I'm living in Arizona, I'm like, that lion's a problem over there. And I, I'm focusing on something. So please yeah. educate me. Yes. And I live next door to New Jersey and New York. Yeah. So I hear about it a little bit more. Sure. Really, the current thing is it's made it harder to remember or find out what's legal. Because laws are getting passed to try to test Bruin mm. that may or may not be con past constitutional muster under the case. But legislators are trying anyway, then it's going to court and we're going back and forth and things are getting stayed and there's injunctions and this, that and the other. And it's a confusing legal morass. So, so in other words, it's pretty much made it impossible to not do anything other than shall issue. But if, is that a really rough? It, it's, it's really more of a decision about like, where can we, in practical impact is where can we tell people they can or can't carry a gun? Like what's a sensitive place? So states like New York are saying it's all sensitive. Yeah. And therefore you can't actually carry a gun there. Yep, yep. And that makes it really difficult. But, you know, the practical impact is there's going to be confusion for a while while we figure this all out. Yeah, and if, if this doesn't align with what certain people's ideology is, they're going to find all sorts of interesting ways to still in, put in restrictions right or try to and then we got to fight this out through the courts and see what happens yeah well that's that's technically that's how the system's supposed to work right uh jane bird self-defense um oh, this is good actually how do you start conversation with friends or family who are making risky self-defense choices this is right up your alley like <laughs> Well, it says carrying a knife. That's interesting because we're going to do a video all about knives. That's not today. But this is actually very appropriate. Are those cat punchy things, which are complete trash. So, so okay, so a good friend of yours decides to buy the cat punchy thing. What do you do? Depends on how good your friendship is. Okay. So there are some friends where you could go, well, that's a dumb decision you made. Sure. And that will actually work. We, we all have friends where we can have that relationship with, where you just be like, what were you thinking? Because if you don't know any better, the cat punchy thing looks good. Oh, it's got spiky thingies. Spiky. It's a little bit cute, so it's fun on your keychain. But in truth is, it might act, it probably will hurt you using it. Yeah. It, it, yeah. So one mm. of the things you could do is, if you think they will be swayed by evidence... I've got videos about this. There's other people who have material. I think there's about... one on in range that we did together. We we talked about. I think about. we 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 did or is related. It's at least adjacent. Yeah, yeah, it's adjacent to stuff I've done. Yeah. For in range, so you could show them a video and say, "Hey, you know, I saw that thing that you bought, and I don't know if you know this about it." So it's that would be the softer approach than you bought something dumb. Let me show you why. It's hey, did you know this? I want you to be safe, but I'm worried that the thing that you chose may actually may not make you safer. It might even make you worse. Like, let me, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because we really have to meet people where you are. And the worst thing to do with that is to start out by calling them dumb. Unless it, you have that relationship It doesn't with them. generally work. Yeah. Like, you got to be really, really good friends before you can just go to them and say, that was dumb. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Like, just, just stop. Sure. We all have that friend where that works. Sure. But for most relationships, it's more, hey, you know, I'm a little uncertain that that's a great idea. Like That's more likely to cause a knee-jerk withdrawal than an engagement. Or let's talk about this choice. Is it a good choice or a bad choice? You, you don't want to tell them that they're a bad person making bad choices, doing bad things. Because who's going to listen to you if you tell them that? If somebody told me I'm a bad person making bad choices, doing bad things, that's going to get me killed. I don't want to hear it. No. You, you don't want to hear that. I really care about your safety. I'm concerned that this tool isn't the way to go. Hey, I saw this video. Would you like to watch it? Because we all know that the best expert is somebody who's not related to you. That's true. It is easier to listen to a, a complete third party, isn't it? In every situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, let's watch this video. Or, hey, I saw this video about that. What do you think? Mm, makes and sense. at the end of the day, people are going to make their own decisions. Sure. But this actually really puts a big old explanation, exclamation point on the importance of what you're doing. Try. Because you are really breaking some of these um, bad ideas and like demonstrating them very, like the, the, like the stun gun video you did for in range. That was like so obvious. Like the point was like punch you in the face clear, but like you hear it. 
make loud noise, look scary. It seems like it would be something useful. Maybe you had one and shocked your you know, neighbor's husband or something. Right, but that's a lot different than a determined attacker, which is what we were talking about. So, But that's like a third party, just like destroying the myth is more sometimes useful. It can sometimes be useful. Sometimes another way to address it is, hey, I saw that you bought this and you're really concerned about your self-defense. I bought you this pepper spray. Mm. Buy them a different I got you tool. this for you. Have you, yeah, have you considered this? this? That's really a good idea. You know, That's kind a really of good redirect idea. it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or even I think maybe I don't want to inject here, but like in this regard, like maybe the question would be like, you're concerned about your self defense. Is everything okay? Yeah, that's like maybe a there's something going do. on there that needs to be talked about. Maybe it's not, but I mean, it's worth broaching that. Maybe. You're like, turns out I broke up with this person and they're like threatening me. You know, who knows? But or like, yeah, turns out that the parking lot at my new school super spooky way <laughs> spookier than i thought it was yeah 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 hey you know what i think would really help you what if we got you a really great flashlight yeah that's awesome yeah it you sounds like it's of... coming from a place of care and that's really the important part because we all just want to be safe we all just want to go home safe yeah most of us at least well yeah <laughs> you do spend a lot of time in the french quarter yeah that's true <laughs> uh chasing that high uh patrick patrick t is it oh wait oh did you want did you have one oh there was yes. part two Self de- okay, this is also from Jane Bird. Self-defense, if permitted, what are some good ways to practice awareness out in public or in marginal situations? Literally, just do it. Just pay attention. How, how, how do you practice paying attention in when you're out in public? I don't know. I can't do it at all. So, so when you go out <laughs> Attention public, hard. When you go out in public, <laughs> remind yourself, hey, yeah. I wanted to learn how to pay attention. Yeah. And make it a point to remind yourself to do it. Active skill. And you might play some games with yourself to do that. Remember how when we were kids, a lot of us played the game on the highway of the, the alphabet game, for yeah. instance. Or slug bug or something like that. Slug bug or pun- punch buggy or whatever. Yeah. So that kind of game. Hey, I'm going to go out and I want to find five green things. Yeah. I'm looking for that. Uh, so do I that when you're in public even? Do like that Make that a game. Make it a way. game. Uh, people watch. That's also causing you to swivel. If you're like, I'm going to find five green things, you're looking around for that. And you're looking at details. Hey, um, I want to people watch today. Pay attention to people. That's, A, it's super, super fun. You see amazing uh, things. People, people are watch. interesting things to watch, for sure. It, but it also teaches you how to pay attention and how to look for things that are different. This is one of those, this is a fun one for me because then I think about it. This was such a, there's such a faux element of this in some firearms training. Where they do the whole thing, pop, 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 and then you do the, this, this thing. And I, there was a class I saw where this, this was smart. The trainer did that, and the people did the, and he had someone come up and was standing there in an elephant costume. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. This really happened. No one on the line saw it. It was all for show, no actual perception. If you're not really perceiving, you're not really perceiving. Oh. So that's really common in those circles. So there, there is a new strain of firearms training that people are doing cognitive pistol. John Hearn does a great job with this. I've heard John Farnham's class is really good with this. I haven't done this with John Farnham yet, but John Hearn has these like boxes with lights and different colors and different combinations. And you have different actions that you're supposed to do based on what nice. you see. That's a really cool idea. And as you build up through the class, There'll be different boxes in different places with different people responding in different ways. And some of the boxes are behind you and the lights. Do you think that teaches you how to look around and pay attention to what you're looking at? Yeah, no, totally. It's actually really testing it versus just that facade of doing it. It's the person standing behind the line. What number was the AI holding up? Yeah, it's a good idea. And like I said, just when you go out in public, remind yourself, hey, I wanted to pay more attention. Mm -hmm. So... Do, do I that. like your idea of turning into a game, though. Like, I'm going to find five game. green things or whatever. Or five purple things. We like that even better. Or uh, one of the things I look for and think about for situational awareness is what's different. Mm. So figure out what's normal for the space you're in. Yeah. What, what's the normal level of noise? What's the normal tone of voice? What's the normal light look like? How do people move normally? And then look for what's different. Fair. That makes sense. The thing that stands out is worth paying attention to. Probably. Patrick T. Is it worth it to have young kids, six and four in my case, learn martial arts? If not, what good foundation should I start them on? 
Martial arts is great. Gymnastics is great. Anything that they learn how to move their bodies. Does it really even matter which one at that point? If you're four, just like do whatever. I, I want to learn kung fu. Who cares? Like just go cool. have a good time, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Go go do the thing. Enjoy it. Mm. Realize that some martial arts, from a practical perspective, may be more useful than others. But there's something to be said for the traditional martial arts, karate school, even taekwondo school. Mm -hmm. Like learning to show up and do the thing and listen to the instructor, discipline. learn the skill, the discipline, the dedication, the eventual leadership that happens. These are all good things. And they teach you how to move your body. Yeah. And I'm more worried, especially at those ages, is building that coordination, building that awareness of where your body is and how to move it. Mm -hmm. So gymnastics actually... You know, putting aside some of the injury potential and yep. whatever else, but at four and six years old, what do they enjoy doing? Find them something that they like and go do that. That makes sense. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Hand loading notes. Any practices or behaviors you would like to see people in self-defense classes and communities do more or less of, especially things that we can change on ourselves on an individual level. I want people to be more mindful. Okay. So when we're doing a thing in whatever kind of training class or context or whatever else, it's, are we doing this with full attention to what we're doing and why we're doing it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we talked about, you know, people in the pistol class and they do, you know, you shoot and then you're like, right. right. So even if that's the way your class is being taught, you individually can decide I'm going to look for where the AI in the red shirt is or whatever, whatever else you want to do that to make it more mindful that you've decided to put yourself in a place of, I'm not just going to do repetitions and not think about what I'm doing and just like, kind of like go through the motions. Mm -hmm. Same thing, jujitsu or any other class that you take, any other training you take, be there, be present, think about what you're doing, think about why you're doing it and be engaged in it. Fair. And I think that that's missing from a lot of us, especially those of us who are training junkies. It's so easy to show up at a class and just like- Yeah, go through the motions. And be like, hey, look, I did the class, I did the practice. But you're not really like thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it and mm -hmm. how you're doing so it. So make it focused and intentional. Yes. I'd rather you not practice than to just go that's through the motions. That's true, going through the motions is probably worse than not at all. Mm -hmm. So here's a really important one from Quactar the Unforgiven. Wait, do we want to talk about Pidgeot toys? Oh, did I miss something? I did again. A same person, hand-loading notes. Any recommendation for fidget toys or other things that aren't guns or defensive gear that you think folks might enjoy or benefit for, fit from if they're into that kind of gear? So there are, you know, everyone loves a pocket knife and things mm -hmm. like that. And if you are clumsy, there are trainer knives <laughs> so that, you know, they don't actually have blades on them so you can be yeah. able... So, you know, if you want to fidget. But... um. I would challenge you to think about fidget toys that aren't out of the world of self-defense. Okay. So like a trainer knife could be that. This is in the world of self-defense. Oh. But, you know, get like just a, like get like one of those like pop fidget toys. Oh, so out get, of the world just of self-defense. I hear you. Just get whatever. It doesn't have to be. A worry stone? Worry stones are great. Uh, mm. Stuffed animals. Like whatever it is. It doesn't. Prayer beads. Prayer beads. <laughs> Rosary, if that's what you're yeah, into. Yeah, if that's what works for you. Yeah. You know, what would people enjoy or benefit from if they're into guns or defensive gear? Don't make that your whole personality, please. Yeah. Even those of us who work in this industry, yeah. it needs to not be our whole personality. Yep. And that's something I think a lot of us have struggled with over time. Even if it's not self-defense, people like take a thing and make it the thing. And that's all the thing is. Whether it's gaming or shooting competitions or whatever. It's like there's more to life than any one thing. So I think you'll benefit from doing another thing. Finding another thing. Fair. Here is the important one from Quacktar the Unforgiven. My wife and I need to get another cat for home defense. Oh, yeah. Since the loss of one has left a hole in our defensive capabilities and strategy. My wife favors an ultra compact model like the Cornish Rex, Singapore, or even skipping a cat entirely and just getting a business of ferrets. I favor a mid-sized model like a, a serval, serval, excuse me, or a bobcat. I think that a mid-sized model will be better for patrol and perimeter defense at the cost of concealability and portability, but my wife insists that we need a cat that's easily portable so we can keep it close at all times. 
We live in a pretty rural area, so we can't depend on the police to arrive in a timely fashion to defend us from moths or crickets, empty boxes, lasers, or balls of paper. Should we compromise on a compact model like a Maine Coon or Savannah? We both agree that a full-size cat's too much for our needs. Is there any reason that she can't get an ultra compact and you get a midsize? Two cats is good because they tend to have sibling relationship. They play. They help when you're each away, other. When you're away from the home, they have someone to depend on that have social social interaction with one another. Sometimes they help each other. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. So one of the compromises, if you can do it, is you each have your preference. It also doubles the cuddles Yeah. when you're going to bed at night. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have to pick one, oh, man, that's a hard one. Maybe you need to get a, a not purebred and find something that's in between the ultra compact. Maybe you do have to compromise on that compact model, mm. but maybe instead of picking a compact breed, you find one that mixes. What about rescuing a street cat mm. that needs a home, but knows the ways of the streets? That could be a really good solution. Because it's bringing skills to the table regardless of its size. Size. Yeah. That's a good potential. And you're giving some, uh, giving that cat a good home. Mm -hmm. Probably doesn't want to live in the cold all the time. Yeah. So it's a real mutual beneficial. Mutual aid. Mutual aid. Mutual We're beneficial. We're all about mutual aid. But it's also mutually beneficial. The cat gets a good home. But you get a cat that's probably learned the way of the streets and is definitely going to be effective against moths, crickets, empty boxes, lasers, or balls of paper because it was already doing it against rats and mice. That would be a really good choice. Yeah. I like that idea. It's kind of in the middle. If, if Size irrelevant at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you can't do two, and I really like the idea of doing two because yeah, I agree. then you both get to be happy with your choice and mm -hmm. then you can have the battles of whose cat is better and who's doing a better job with that box. Mm -hmm. Fair. And, totally. I agree. So this one comes from Player, which is not Patreon, and thank you for being a supporter on either one. FMJ, how does one train to run away? I don't expect to find an instructor course on tactical flee. <laughs> it's true. Even though they probably should talk about that more than they do. But like, There's yeah. a, There are better and worse ways to flee. Okay. Tell us. Going backwards tends to be a bad don't idea. Don't run backwards. You can run forwards faster than you can run backwards. And running towards is usually a bad idea. Don't run to the threat. I, I know that sounds really obvious, but bear with me for a moment. Sometimes you, uh, sometimes you brain fart. Sure. So, you know, uh, in the muck context, the managing unknown contacts world with Craig Douglas, he yep. likes that arcing motion. Yep. So that Lateral movements lateral. Or, or even, what do you, what's the word, uh, diagonal movements. Diagonal, yeah, yeah, the yeah. arc. Uh, a lot of people talk about whether or not you cross your feet. Yeah, that's I contentious. I personally go with the don't think, overthink it and just move your feet. Actually, just get to where just, you need just, to get. Just go where, if you tend to cross your feet because you were a dancer in a previous life. Sweet. I'm not going to But going backwards dangerous. One, you can't do it very fast. And two, you don't know what you're walking into. Yeah. You might be walking into something worse. Another attacker. Or a curb. A bunch of broken glass in a trash can, which isn't going to help. A toddler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in fact, you, there are better and worse ways to run away. But really what you need to do is uh, go to the gym. Next question. <laughs> uh, Own Terry. Would you? This is another very important one. Would you ra rather wrestle one human-sized squid or ten? What? Wrestle one human-sized squid or ten human-sized squids? That's the same thing. I one over ten. Is it maybe? I think it, I think it was meant to say. Would you rather wrestle one human-sized squid or ten standard-sized squids? These squids are around the level of a blue belt. So ten regular squids or one human-sized squid? Ah. Uh. I think I'd do one human-sized squid. There's only one set of tentacles to deal with. Because there's only one set, and you can't be, like, flanked by only another squid. Only one beak, too, because squids have beak like octopus. I think Do so. They? I think so. Either way. But it's, either way, it's only oh, one, one set of tentacles. Because getting flanked by, like, three squids on each side. That sounds scary. That, I don't know how to deal with that. And mm. they're little. Right? Yeah. Yep, yep. You know, if they're regular-sized squid, with the human-sized squid, I would think that the arms and stuff are, like, more... Human size, so there's a lot of them. But and least, then they have more power with those suction cups, right? The, the, like they'll be stronger, but they'll be like more of a. I'm not like trying to like pinch little tentacles. Yeah. I'm yeah. like grabbing tentacles. So mm. I think I'd do one human size squid. That makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, if they're a blue belt, you know, mm. blue belts. <laughs> Fair. 
I'm gonna like take these last two questions. I'm gonna do them out of order because I think I know the answer to the, this one before the next one. I think we can finish on the other one. So Matthew J, what if anything do you carry in places where not only weapons but most common day everyday tools are banned? Does this come back to pepper spray again? Because that seems to be the recurring answer. When you say everyday tools are banned, where the hell is that? Like. What hellscape is it you can't, like, I don't know where that is, and I don't want to be there. But I'm assuming that's a reality. You know what? That sounds like Singapore or something like that, right? Yeah. But, like... Because I'm like, if you go to an airport, you can still bring a screwdriver. No, 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 you can. That's a good point. But, like, let's, if it says everyday tools are banned, places like Singapore, that's a reality. You find yourself in Singapore, so what do you do? I hate to be a uh, stereotype and everything, but your most important weapon is your Mm. Sure. I, I know it's trite. I know it's silly and everything. But at the end of the day, the tools are supporting what you know how to do. Mm. And they help you do the thing that you know how to do. But it's not the, I know how to shoot somebody. It's knowing I need to shoot somebody. I need to deal with a bad guy. That's the important part. Or right? need to run in an I oblique. Need to run. <laughs> I need to do yeah. that. Yeah. So the... <laughs> What do I carry in those places? I carry actually paying attention to the problem. I carry uh, understanding what I need to do to minimize potential problems. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm going to be a little bit more careful. If I'm at, say, a school campus where I cannot be caught with a gun, I cannot sure. be caught with pepper spray, I cannot be caught with a knife, I must just be, then maybe I'm going to take advantage of that campus escort service. If they provide it, if certainly. They provide it. Push the button and ask ask for them to come get you to your car or whatever, right? Or make friends with somebody who parks in the same parking garage. Fair. Better so, to be two of you than one of you. And you know, take. I'm going to be much more aware of what do I need to do to reduce my danger. Carrying a friend around is always a good tactic in life. <laughs> That's never bad. A lot of my friends are large mammals. Well, but regardless, two people <laughs> having a having having someone next to you is always a good idea, especially someone that you trust and believe in. For anything in life. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, I'm carrying, paying attention. I'm carrying knowledge. Mm. And I'm carrying the awareness that I don't have my tools. Yep. So, cool. you know, one of the places that I don't carry a gun is when I go to jiu-jitsu. Because I'm going to the gym and I'm going home. There's not, like, stopping right. in And you're not going to leave it in your car. And I'm not going to leave it in my car. And I don't happen to have a secure place to lock it up in my gym. Yep. It's not true in all gyms. But in mine, it's true. So I don't stop in places before and after. I changes your behavior pattern. Changes right? my behavior pattern. I think about the fact that I am at my jujitsu gym, which happens to be in a location that I don't have like strip mall, drive by other people. So I know who's in that parking lot, who I expect to see mm -hmm. and who I don't. If I was really concerned, I could say to one of the guys, hey, could you walk me to my car? Sure. They might laugh at me. But they'll walk me to my car. Yeah, yeah. Or I could sit in my car paying attention to what's going on and say, hey, my teammate has just driven up. I'm going to get out of my car at the same time so we can walk in together. Yep. Makes sense. All right. Last one. Really important. TJ, uh, what's your take on dogs for self or home defense? I think dogs are fabulous companions. Sure are. Whether or not you can use them as an element in your defensive plan... One depends on how much time you're willing to put into training your dog. Sure. Because just having a dog that barks may or may not do anything to the person who wants in your house. You'll also stop paying attention to a dog that barks at everything. Because if it barks at everything, eventually it's always a false alarm until the day it isn't. Now, if you have a dog that doesn't do that, that's a different story. Or I can tell you from my own experience, my dogs made different sounds based on things. There were times where the bark told me... They didn't necessarily tell me there was an intruder, but the sound of the bark was like, oh, that's something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And what that tended to be was actually was a rattlesnake. But they did do that. And that was, but that was me knowing them. Right? Yeah. So it was, it, was a, it a, was a commonality in a relationship at that point. It can be an aspect. I don't think there's much reliability to, well, if a bad guy who wants to rob you hears a dog, they'll be scared away. Or if they see that you have, you know, big dog toys in your yard, they won't target you. I think that's a harder one because there's no way to prove or disprove that. Right? I think there's an element of if you're just like a snatch and grab, or you're going to break a window and go grab a, VC, you know, a VCR. What, what year is this? 1992? <laughs> grab a thing. Um, if you get to the house and there's like a big German shepherd in there, 
that's that that goes to the window and barks at it. I think there's a good chance you'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna go to the next house with a VCR. Maybe on you might also hand, just throw them a big piece of meat and move on in, right? So your locked door might have as much effect. It could, like, but that's another layer, right? Right. So could it help? I guess maybe uh, the whole like my dog is actually going to be defending. You know, like the attack dog Unless thing. They're very trained for that. That's a lot of work. Like, look what look what police dogs or military dogs go through for training to be effective at their job. It's like no different than the human training to be proficient. It's just as much, if not more. It's a lot of work yep. to have a working dog. And it's a relationship with a specific handler, too. Mm-hmm. You don't just hand that dog off to someone else and it doesn't do the same thing. And it yeah. could be dangerous to that person. Sure could, yeah. And think about, you know, uh, dogs can do a lot of damage. Oh, heck yeah. If that's what they're trained to do. And even if it's not what they're trained to do. So, and then there's other aspects of if you have a dog, what if you travel and can't bring your dog? Do you take it to a kennel or do you decide I'm going to get a dog sitter? If you get a dog sitter, is that somebody that you know? Yeah, and does you, the dog know? And does, does the dog, dog like know. that person? And blah, blah, blah. Or what if it's a stranger that you picked off your local Facebook community group? It's a good way to get bit. It's a, it, it's, it's a, good, way to, it's a good way to get robbed. Oh, yeah, that's true. But you're giving them information about your home and metadata. and They become friends with the dog, too. Yeah. And one of the things I see in my local Facebook community group is people post, Hi, I'm going away the first two weeks of July. Oh, that's always I need a, a dog sitter. That's always a smart thing to do. Always pro- bro- broadcast when your home is empty and when the dog's not there. For the duration of time you're going to be away... It's a or winning strategy. Your dog's also, there, but you're inviting somebody over to come take care of your dog. Definitely do it on next door too. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it can actually be a hole in your self defense, and depending <laughs> on how you do it, maybe make it a Facebook event. <laughs> I'm going to be away from home for <laughs> for these two weeks. I need a dog, and then sitter. invite everyone on your list, and then see what happens. Yeah, somebody's <laughs> got to come feed the dog. So you might want to, and then you're going to walk the dog and you're exposing yourself to everything that happens when you go walk a dog in the dark sure. because it's the sunset at five o'clock and you got home at six and the dog needs to go out yep. for, which, you know, not a huge risk, but I'm saying balance all There's of this There's also together. the argument to be saying that if you do that, that's also just good for you as a person to go taking your dog for a walk is a very healthy, happy thing. And Even if you don't want to. They kind of make you, yeah. and that's not a bad thing either. So you're right; it's a mix, but that's a mix. A mixed bag. I wouldn't. It's not smart. You're gonna do that at two in the morning unless you had to. But yeah. And, and there's there are wonderful things to be said about animal animal companionship yep. in general for mm-hmm. your mental health and everything it's else. True. So I'd say get a dog because you want to get a dog mm-hmm. and want a dog in your life. And if there's any bonuses to your home defense or self defense, it's cool. just a cool perk, right? Cool. Yeah. But I wouldn't. That's not why I would get a dog. Yeah. I'd get a dog because I wanted a dog. That makes sense. Because it is a huge lifestyle change. Oh, it is. It, it is. You are very much. If you're going to be a proper uh, dog companion, you're doing you're doing all the right things, right? There's the medical care, the feeding, the walking, the time. paying attention, the time, the training. It is not a really, it should not be a lightweight decision. Uh, that's why I don't have a dog right now. Because mm. I travel too much. Yeah, and that's sad because then the dog's home alone. And dogs really don't do well without companionship. Right. Cats, yeah. more so. <laughs> they, yeah. They're more like, eh, you're back. Cool, where's my food? But yeah, not always, but they need companionship too. I'm not saying they don't. But dogs are very sensitive to that. Well, dogs, you need somebody every single day to oh. be taking them out. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but they'll also, they mean, they miss you. And they miss it's you. It's very really obvious, yeah. Cats, at least, you know, you can put out a bowl of food for them. And not all cats They'll be pretty, be they'll at least day. be chill until you get back. And then they have litter boxes. I mean, we've all seen the video of, like, the soldier coming home after, like, three years or whatever. And the dog sees him and is like, oh, my gosh. It's been three years and the dog is, like... Still remembers and still miss that person, right? Yeah. So get a dog because you love dogs and you want that dog. Yeah. Don't get a dog because you think it's going to make your home safer. Right. It's like, don't get the black cat to be spooky and don't buy a pit bull because it's scary. These are bad ideas. Yeah. Buy the pit bull because you love that dog and you want that dog. Or buy, adopt, even better. So these are the end of the Q&A questions, but that is not the end of the collaboration we're doing on this trip because you're going to give us quite a talk uh, Tomorrow night we're going to film this about knives. Yes. We don't talk about knives on InRange because it's a weird topic that people get really weird about. People. Knives and flashlights, people are strange. Knife people are really, really weird. <laughs> and I say that as this 
much of what's on this table is my personal collection. That makes you a knife person. Yeah. So, <laughs> but knife people are super, super weird. Yeah. And there's a lot of mythology about knives and self-defense. Yeah. And a lot of people have very specific ideas about what they think works and don't doesn't yeah. work and how how what knife fights and knifings look like. And we're going to talk about some of that, dispel some of those myths. Sweet. And you can all argue with me in the comments, and I won't respond. Well, you're not the right... I'm not the right person for this, because I am not really a knife person. And you... What? Well, <laughs> let's talk to someone that's done the work, and that's going to be awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun, and we I'm are. going to kill a lot of myths, I hope. Sweet. So while that'll be filmed here tomorrow night in magic internet time, it may probably come out the next day, but because we'll space the videos out because that's the way it works, but we are doing these fun collab. And so stay tuned after this Q and A uh, to the channel for a contentious knife debate to ensue, not only in the video, but in the comments below. So Annette, always a pleasure. Thank you for coming out. Uh, it's been really fun today. This Q and A is really great. I love what you bring to the table. So I love having you on the channel and I'm excited to do this as well, so. I am too. Thank you so much for the invitation to work with you, the platform, oh. and the fun that it is fun. we have already had and we yeah. will have. And so to check out more of your work on her own. Dot life. Mm -hmm. and that's the website. On her own life tends to be how you can find me on almost every form of social media that I actually use. Okay. And some of that's more active than others, some days than others. As always, we put that in the link in the description below. But I know the way YouTube works, not all of you see the description, so now you heard it. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more.